distinguished guests, Professor Dr. Lim Keng Xiang's family and friends, fellow professors, doctors, researchers, and colleagues to this very special event hosted by the Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. A very warm welcome to those joining us on YouTube live stream as well. I am Dr. Fong Sile, and I'm honored to be the master of ceremony for this inaugural event of my colleague and my mentor, Professor Dr. Lim Keng Xiang. A professor's inaugural lecture is one of the University of Malaya's cherished traditions. These lectures honor the professional journeys taken by our professors and provides an opportunity for them to share with us their wisdom, their inspirations and philosophies. We are grateful to be here today as the audience to this inaugural lecture by Professor Dr. Lim Keng Xiang, a dedicated neurologist and expert in epilepsy and an acknowledged leader in its field of expertise. Today, Professor Dr. Lim Keng Xiang will be sharing his journey in the field with us in his inaugural lecture titled, Pushing the Boundaries, Comprehensive Care and Global Network of Epilepsy. I would like to now invite the Dean of Faculty of Medicine, Professor Dr. April, to chair the lecture and to introduce Professor Dr. Lim Keng Xiang. Welcome, Prof. April. Sorry, testing my technical skills there. The Honorable Professor Dr. Lim Keng Xiang, Professor of Neurology at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. Distinguished guests, respected colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, whether you are joining us here physically today or virtually. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera and welcome to the inaugural lecture of Professor Dr. Lim Keng Xiang. Some of you, like me, may be old enough to know the song Vincent, written and sung by Don McLean in the 1970s. This song was a paean to one of my favorite artists, Vincent van Gogh, whose life was tragically cut short from suicide. What is perhaps less known is that the brilliance of his paintings and downward spiral to his eventual demise stemmed, in part at least, from the seizures he suffered as a result of epilepsy. Epilepsy is therefore not only a neurological disorder requiring medical treatment, it can result in significant negative psychological, social and economic consequences. Doctors venturing to manage these patients must do so holistically, improving their quality of life, but also supporting their families, raising public awareness, and reducing stigmatization. Our orator today has spent most of his career doing exactly that. Professor Dr. Lim Keng Xiang graduated from University of Malaya in 1999 and completed his internship at Hospital Sultana Bahia in Alostar, Kedah before joining University of Malaya Medical Center in 2005. Completing neurology subspecialty training in 2008, he went on to complete epilepsy fellowships, first in Melbourne in 2011, followed by Cleveland in 2017. He is currently professor of neurology at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, and consultant neurologist specializing in epilepsy at University of Malaya Medical Center and University of Malaya Specialist Center. As an academic clinician, Professor Lim is constantly searching for better ways to manage his patients. He has been involved in many trials of novel treatments for epilepsy, which increasingly involve multidisciplinary input and multimodality delivery, including 
transcranial magnetic stimulation. Working with neurosurgeons, he has developed expertise in non-invasive and invasive epilepsy surgery assessment, including long-term video EEG monitoring, intracranial monitoring with stereo EEG, subdural and depth electrodes, electrocardiography, and cortical stimulation. Other areas of expertise include vagal nerve stimulation and callosotomy evaluation and monitoring. An avid researcher, he has published 119 original papers in high impact journals and has an H index of 19. His research focuses on the psychosocial aspects of epilepsy, clinical studies, especially epilepsy, surgery, and seizures in brain tumors, genetics in focal and familial epilepsies, pharmacogenomics and pharmacokinetics of anti-epileptic drugs, quantitative EEG, and quantitative MRI research, as well as artificial intelligence. As principal investigator and co-investigator in many local and international research projects, he has strong interdisciplinary collaborations across the globe, including Southeast Asia, Taiwan and Hong Kong, Australasia, and the United Kingdom. These leadership qualities have seen him take on influential roles in many local and international organizations. He sits on the Malaysian Epilepsy Council and is a past president of both the Malaysian Epilepsy Society and the Malaysian Society of Neurosciences. Internationally, he is the General Secretary of the Asian and Oceanian Commission International League Against Epilepsy, the Chair of the Research Task Force in the Commission, and ex-chair of the Research Commission in the International Bureau of Epilepsy. He is currently the Associate Editor for Neurology Asia, an editorial board member of the Journal of Xiangya Medicine, and an organizing committee member of the recent 7th Asian Oceanian Congress on Clinical Neurophysiology held in February of 2021. A very long list of achievements. But before we begin, I would like to remind you that the last verse of Don McLean's song goes, Now I think I know what you tried to say to me, how you suffered for your sanity, how you tried to set them free. They would not listen. They're not listening still. Perhaps they never will. Professor Lim Keng Xiang is one of those who has listened. So in turn, let us listen to him as he shares how he has striven to reduce the suffering of those with epilepsy. Professor Lim, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, uh, my friends and colleagues, mentors and teachers, and especially thank you very much for our honor, uh, Dean Prof. April, to share and introduce uh, me in this lecture. Prof. April has shared with us the, sorry, uh, do you mind to switch the slide so that the others can see the slides. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm. So Prof. April has shared with us the mission and visions of UM during her dean lectures in February. I am a UM graduate in 1999 and joined back UM in 2005 after my MRCP. And uh, for me, this mission and visions are not only for UM, but also my personal uh, mission and vision as well. So that you can see that my titles of today's talks is where is it coming from, which is pushing the boundaries. Mother Teresa has told us, none of us, including me, ever do great things, but we can do all, all do small things with great love, and together we can do something wonderful. 
Today's lectures is not about me alone. Whatever I've done are small things, but together with my whole teams, which I have introduced to you later on, that we can do great things together in University of Malaya. The lecture today will be divided into two sections. The first one is comprehensive care, and the second one is on global network. Epilepsy is not only a neurological disorder, it's not only treating medically and reducing the seizures is our own or main aims. There are always people with epilepsy. We need to look at them, understand them, and help them to improve their psychological well-being, and as well as their families and communities. And educating communities is, in, in fact, a big component of our jobs uh, as uh, educators as well as uh, clinicians in Malaysia. Our work are not only in University of Malaya, we have many collaborations and teachings as well as uh, tele-conference uh, and referrals from other hospitals as well in Malaysia and works involve uh, other regions in the Asian Oceanian regions as well as other parts of the world. Epilepsy is not just a medical illness. Epilepsy is defined as a disease with two seizures or one seizure with a recurrence, recurrence risk of 60%. But yet we know that what is seizures? Seizures are in fact a problem with abnormal electrical activities in the brain, which has multiple uh, clinical presentations. The one that we know are mostly stiffness and jerkings of the limbs, and sometimes they have uprolling of the eyeballs. But sometimes, some patients, their seizures are very subtle. They may be just blank stare, having a aura of fear. And sometimes, they are just lip smacking, hearing things, seeing rainbows. And people may not notice that they are, in fact, having a seizure attacks in front of them. And seizures can be due to various medical uh, causes. But more importantly, Epilepsy has its own psychological, social, and economic consequences, which lead to a poor quality of life. And therefore, our care for epilepsy are not medical treatment only to reduce their seizures, but also taking care of them as a person. In Malaysia, this is our first national population survey uh, in collaboration with Institute Kesihatan Negara, uh, when we, which, was, which reported a prevalence of epilepsy of 7.8 per 1,000 Malaysians. What does it mean? It means that out of 100 Malaysians, every 100 Malaysians, there will be one person who may have epilepsy. But their seizures can be very subtle and unnoticed because their seizures may happen at night, may happen at home and during sleep or very subtle in front of you and you, are, you, you don't even notice that. And some of them... Their seizures can be very severe. This is our work on mortality in epilepsy. We show that out of 100,000 persons, there are 667 of them die every year. In, in brief, what it means is that every 100 patients of us, on every year in average, one may die because of seizures or epilepsy-related complications. But yet many people don't understand epilepsy. They are having fear about the word epilepsy or even fear about knowing people with epilepsy. And when they see a seizure, they, will, uh, they, will, they are all in fear. The names of epilepsy in many local languages implies the image of insanity and associated with animals. Like for example, in Mandarin, it's called Yang Dian Zhen or Fat Yang Diao. It actually means goods and madness and this caused a uh, unfamiliarity of people of it show the fear of people or the public against epilepsy yet our work start with uh, medical treatment and this is a history of what happened in university of malaya and as well as cert certain parts of malaysia which i'm going through and i'll go through the details uh, later on uh, one by one but uh, firstly, I would like to declare that I will try, because I've promised my wife, family, and uh, my friends to keep this lecture as simple as possible so that everyone can understand, including my patients. 
uh, and so that they can see a hope. In fact, uh, my initial topics is hope for hope in epilepsy, uh, so that patients with epilepsy will see hope in the in Malaysia. So uh, EG started service started with the beginning of the the beginning of hospital in 1960s, and uh, UKM and USM started epilepsy surgery uh, later on. And at that time, most of our cases are referred to UKM for epilepsy surgery. And I joined Neurology in 2005, as what uh, Prof. April mentioned just now. Uh, I went to Melbourne for my uh, video EG monitoring training and subsequently learning intracranial monitoring in Sissoka, Japan, as well as Dero EG in Cleveland. And then hopefully we can expand our service further uh, in the future, as well as develop or use more uh, recent or newer generation of seizure medications for the benefit of our patients. And with this, uh, it is impossible, as I said, or Mother Teresa has mentioned, it is impossible without a big teams, which include our mentors, our neurologists, pediatricians, surgeons, pathologists, radiologists, and the whole big family of neural labs and neural technologies. And uh, I would like to say Thank you to all uh, for the success and achievement until today in epilepsy service. This is a picture of Prof Tan, which was taken during his first uh, talk uh, lecture in 2018. And you can see how far he looked beyond and beyond <laughs> the boundaries. In, when I first joined uh, the uh, neuro lab as an elective student, uh, at that time, the EG is still using pens and papers. And uh, in the lab, I can see a stack of whole, whole stack of EG papers fill the whole neural uh, office. Especially, just imagine one overnight, uh, one overnight sleep study of EEG will have one whole stack of papers for people to go through in details, which was technically very challenging. And because of that, I have the opportunity to uh, further my fellowship in Melbourne, uh, especially learning video EEG. And at that time, or when the time I came back, uh, the most of the EEG has slowly been converted to dig digital EEG. And with videos, we can record not only the epileptic discharges in the brain, but also uh, the videos of the patients having seizure in corresponding to the EEG. This helps us to understand epilepsy much better, and we have developed a very unique protocol pertaining to Malaysia, which is this 48 hours video EG monitoring. In Melbourne, the recording of one patient is for two weeks. Just imagine one machine is connected to a person for two weeks for e video EG recording. And this is nearly impossible in Malaysia or many other countries which have only a few EG machines. And in order to do more in a very cost-effective way, we have to modify the program and protocol, and this is a protocol we use. Together with Prof. Nolisa and Katini, who has helped us to develop the MRI protocol for epilepsy. And later on, we have started our ictal spec services uh, for people with epilepsy. And just imagine, ictal spec uh, is a very technically difficult uh, procedures to do. We have to wait for the patients to have seizures in order to inject the traces, which is a nuclear colors, to the brain uh, using the vein uh, during the seizures. And in order to do that, we need to wait for many hours to capture the seizures. And after that, we have uh, the PET scan as well as MRI PET core registrations, uh, which has which is because we have a very strong support from our radiology uh, department. And together, we have written a review on neuroimaging and refractory epilepsy. And the MI protocol is now widely used in many centers in Malaysia, as well as some of the regional uh, centers who want to start epilepsy surgical service. Prof. Wairavan, who is sitting here, he came back together uh, around the same time uh, as me from UK, he is a neurosurgeon. Epilepsy surgery has two components. 
For neurologists, we do preclinical epilepsy evaluations, which is trying to find out which part of the brain is uh, causing the seizure. And the surgeon will be involving in removing that part of the brain, resulting in a cure in epilepsy. If we manage to find the area of the brain uh, causing seizures and remove completely, then the patient will have a chance or hope to have a cure. Just look at this patient who is 22 years old man having seizures involving the face and jaw. And this is a calendar showing how frequent is his seizures, which is nearly every day. And in the MRI, the lesion is very subtle, but with a pad, we managed to identify that particular region and then uh, had a surgery. And that region is corresponding to the face and jaw of, uh, in the brain. He had a surgery in 2016 and became seizure-free since then. This is, in fact, a cure for him and a cure in epilepsy. However, a lot of times, uh, the scalp recording, which is recording of EEG on the scalp, is not is enough. Sometimes it's very subtle, and sometimes our recordings are not adequate to identify the area of the brain causing the seizure, and we need intracranial monitoring which I subsequently have a chance to go to Sizoka, uh, the National Epilepsy Center in 2015, which is very close to uh, Mao Fuji, looking from different angles. We subsequently performed the recording in the OT, which is called intraoperative ECOX, whereby inside the OT, the skull was open, the electrodes was put, exactly on the surface of the brain or into the brain and recording the seizures during the, during the operation time and uh, decide where the seizure is coming from and do surgery. But this is inadequate. Subsequently, we decided to do a prolonged intracranial monitoring uh, protocol whereby patient's skull is open, electrodes is put on the surface of the brain, the skull is closed back, patient sent out to the ward for continuous uh, monitoring for another one to two weeks in order to capture the seizures and decide where the seizures is coming from. This is a 19 years old man with a seizure over the back of the brain called parietal lobe. He has almost daily seizures and the electrodes on the surface of the brain record a seizure at the back of, the, of, of his brain and he had uh, operations done 13 and uh, became seizure free as well. But we know intracranial monitoring is very complex and very costly. In fact, in the Southeast Asian, there are only five countries who can have or who had, uh, who is having, which is having uh, the intracranial monitoring service. This is still far from beyond. Uh, what we hope to have, especially in the region and in many uh, resource-limited countries. And these are all limited by the barriers and availabilities of various factors. But yet, with a team effort in University of Malaya, we can push the boundaries and we have managed to achieve an outcome which is corresponding to the international standards. And we have published this in 2017. However, intracranial monitoring can, be, uh, can have various types of complications and a better technique is developed over time and one of those is stereo EEG. I would like to acknowledge a uh, Fulbright scholar, uh, Scholarship which has supported me uh, to learn stereo EEG in Cleveland uh, in 2017. This is a 33 years old patient who had five to 10 seizures every day. And his seizures are very complex and people think he is having psychiatric problems. In fact, before he, is, he saw us, he is under the psychiatric care and on psychiatric medications. And what steroid EG is, is putting multiple holes on the skull. And then the EG electrodes is put through these holes into the brain to record the seizures and we managed to record the seizures from a very small area of the brain in these patients. The patient had radiofrequency ablations, which is 
burning the part of the brain with heat, and he became seizure free since then, even without uh, a resection. However, surgery is only applicable in, two, in a small group of patients who had refractory epilepsy. In fact, most patients are still relying for on uh, anti-seizure medications. If you look at the green uh, medications, which are the third generation drugs, these are the newest medications that is developed for epilepsy. In most centers in Malaysia, there are only a few of them available. For example, in clinics, in most clinics, there may be one or two, and some clinics there may, may not be even one newer anti-seizure medications. And in district hospital, which we have recently do a, do, did a survey, some of them has only two, three, or three, four anti-seizure medic, the newer anti-seizure medications. And in some tertiary hospital without neurologists, there may be only five or six. The one that we have now is more than 10 in University Malaya. And we make this available so that patient, we can personalize the choice in uh, various patients so that every patient can have the best or uh, most suitable choice of anti-seizure medications. But yet, this is limited by uh, uh, the affordability. Some of these medications are subsidized now but some of those patients have to pay out of their own pockets. And some of these are very expensive. We have only one patient on rofinamide, which costs about four to 5,000 a month. Our Everolimus, which is used in uh, kidney uh, renal transplant, but also in one of the specific uh, epilepsy syndrome, costs about 12,000 a month. And the cannabidiol, which is a metabolite or substrates of cannabis, which was shown to be effective in epilepsy, uh, cost almost 15,000 a month. And that's why we don't have cannabidiol in Malaysia. But yet we need to make sure patients have more options in the future uh, or beside treatment of uh, medication, medical treatment or surgical treatment, there are other options. For example, vagal nerve stimulations, which has been used in Malaysia since the year 2000, and we have recently had uh, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulations, which was shown to be effective in some patients and was reported uh, uh, to be effective in Malaysia. Recently, we have uh, the opportunity to use transcutaneous vagal nerve stimulation, which doesn't need any surgery. There is no operation needed. Uh, patient is just like wearing a Walkman for four hours a day and out of the first few patients who have tried this, I have one patient who is already planned to do epilepsy surgery and she is now seizure free with this transcutaneous VNS for nearly 10 months. Uh, we have also recently tried uh, transcranial direct current stimulations with the help of our red, uh, rehab uh, team and department and applied to a patient with few seizure a day and with this she had now only one or two uh, day seizures. There are always many other options. Deep, deep brain stimulation was used, uh, is used for Parkinson's disease and now was proven to be effective in epilepsy. Ketogenic diet was used mostly for children and now was also being useful for adults as well as video aging monitoring, which can be done at home uh, and patients can sleep in their comfortable room and have their EEG recording uh, performed without coming to the hospitals. But yet, medical treatment is not all in the comprehensive care. We still look into the person with epilepsy. Improving psychological well-being is very important. People with epilepsy has a multitude of social, psychological, and economic challenges. In our initial study, we found that people with epilepsy is 13 times more likely to be unemployed as compared to their siblings. And they are also more likely to be single, to have lower education level and have lower income as well. And this is all related to stigma and leading to poor quality of life. But yet, there is always hope. We always thought that people with uncontrolled seizures, someone with continuous seizures or at least seizures once a month, they cannot work, 
they cannot live a normal life. But in fact, we found that people with uncontrolled seizures can work. The red bar are for those with uncontrolled seizures. The blue bar are for those with controlled seizures. And we found that their employment rates is almost similar with no significant difference statistically, although the red bar is slightly lower than the blue. There is always hope. In the past, people identified many factors causing low employment among people with epilepsy. And these factors include inability to work, self-determined motivation, support at workplace, and family support and protection. So what we found is that what was found in the past is that people with epilepsy are unable to work. They have low motivations. They are difficult to maintain their jobs. They are having many challenges without much support and family can be overprotective as well. But in our study, in those with uncontrolled seizures, we found that these factors can be a positive factors leading to employment among people with uncontrolled seizures. There are always opportunity and potential despite someone with uncontrolled seizures. And this is the hope that we want to see uh, among our patients with epilepsy. And therefore, we form a very big psychology team this year so that we can understand them more, we can screen them, we can identify those who are having anxiety and depressions, and we can have projects and interventions to help them to overcome these challenges. The work that was done in the last few years is on positive psychological interventions. And the one that we have performed used is mindfulness-based interventions, which was proven to increase the mindfulness of a person, leading to reduce anxiety and depressions, and subsequently leading to better quality of life and improved life satisfactions. During COVID pandemics, many patients are afraid to come to the hospitals because of COVID, because of MCO. In order to overcome their fears, we have provided many ways of them to contact us whenever there is a need. So we have given them our WhatsApp number, we have given them our emails, so that patients can contact us at any time. Whenever there is a need, we will arrange for early consultations, allowing patients to come back despite a cut down in our clinics. And this was shown, even a simple contact like this and early consultations was shown to improve the anxiety depressions among uh, our patients with epilepsy, especially those with uncontrolled seizures or having problems with their seizure medications. But yet our work is not only for people with epilepsy, but we also take care of their families and educating the community as well. My PhD uh, is on social stigma in epilepsy. During my PhD studies, we have as a team developed a public attitudes towards epilepsy skill called PATE, PETS skill, which look at stigma in two dimensions. One is the general domains and second is the personal domains. In the past, a lot of stigma skills asking about general statements for example, people with epilepsy should not marry. This is a very general statement that every one of us can be very positive. We will always have uh, give a positive answer to a general statement like this. Most people in the public will think that, of course, they can work, they can get married, they can study. But whenever we ask them about personal statements, for example, I would feel uncomfortable working with someone who has epilepsy, the attitudes can become very negative, even in those with high education level. Therefore, we try to understand whether this applied to many other populations in other parts in Malaysia, in various populations in other countries as well, and we found the similar findings. Personal attitudes can be negative, and this is what most of our patients are facing. 
they are facing negative attitudes from teachers, negative attitudes from their employers, their friends, and they are having a lot of challenges in life. And in order to understand the reason behind these attitudes, we have subsequently developed a models, a complex perception attitudes models, which try to show the interactions between the perceptions and attitudes. And the models, we call it pet stigmatizations model. The right is on the attitudes based on the pet skills that uh, we have developed, and the right are on the perceptions. And the perceptions can be divided into attributions and contextualizations. In a simple examples, what it means is, is that if someone thinks seizure is severe, seizure can be harmful, or people with epilepsy have poor ability in mental and physical abilities, then they will have negative attitudes towards them. They will think that can, they cannot study. If I can employ, I will employ someone without epilepsy. And if they are having a relationship, knowing someone with seizures, they will be worried whether this can be inherited to the next generations. And the ne negative attitudes models is important for us to counter or to overcome these attitudes in the future. My mentor, Professor Stan, has a very new way of looking at stigma using Chinese culture. What he thinks is that in Chinese culture, we have been taught to overcome adversity and challenges in life with vitality and virtue. If people with epilepsy are, upbring, are, are brought up with Chinese culture and uh, some of our Asian culture having a strong virtue, despite having physical disability or medical illness like stigma and epilepsy and stigma, they would be able to overcome this with, uh, without feeling ashamed. And therefore, we have tried to look at our patients as well as their families in understanding how much burden they have and hopefully in the future we can see the interaction with, between the families and the patients and see how we can help the family as well. This study on burdens in epilepsy in, in caregivers show that caregivers can have very high burden and this burden can be affected by the family functioning and dynamics as well as leading to depression, anxiety and poor quality of life. Many of our parents are overburned. They are already 70s, 80s, and patients is 40s, 50s. And the patients are not working, and they are worried, but they are already old. These challenges will be there, and they have difficulty to pass down the responsibility to other uh, children or to even to the nursing care. With that, we therefore advocate a lot of social and public works through the Malaysian Society of Epilepsy. These are our YouTube, Facebook group, page, Twitters, and website. And here we have Dr. Serini, who is the president of, uh, who is the current president of Malaysian Society of Epilepsy, sitting with us. We are all working together in fighting epilepsy in the publics. Uh, for information, I was the past presidents and the current uh, medical advisors, and thank you to the committees and man, many advocates and volunteers in the Epilepsy Society in working together, fighting and helping and empowering the patients and the families. And these are our, these are our patient support group. We have many activities together uh, to improve or to encourage to uh, patients to come out, to be confident, to be uh, working together in a group in fighting uh, whatever challenges they have. Now I'll come to the second part of the lecture, which is on global network. Global network start with education. I join uh, Malaysian Society of Neuroscience, which is the main society for neurologists in Malaysia and many neurosciences, scientists and students and uh, join Epilepsy Council. Epilepsy Council is the professional body 
uh, for epilepsy in Malaysia in 2008, and I became the president of uh, MSN in 2014. With that, we have organized many conferences, workshops, and courses for people with epilepsy uh, for, to train doctors and juniors in epilepsy in many parts uh, or many states in Malaysia. I became the ASNA, which is ASEAN Neurological Association's treasurer in 2014. Subsequently, became the executive co committee uh, commission member for ILAEAO in 2013. ILAE stands for International League Against Epilepsy, which is the World Organization for Epilepsy, and AO is the ASEAN Oceanian Commissions. And I have the opportunity. Uh, proposed and guided by Prof Tan to be the uh, committee uh, commission member in 2013. And this year, uh, I became the secretary uh, for ILAEAO. With that, we have organized. Uh, there are many courses, conferences that has been organized under ILAE and ASNA in uh, various parts of the Asian Oceanian regions for people, for to train doctors in various countries. But the main thing of all is to have a good mentor and to have successes. This is a very unique uh, photo which we have taken uh, during our MSN uh, conference in Tranganu, where four generations of neurologists in UM, four generations of MSN uh, presidents uh, sing together and uh, I still believe their voices are very nice, which I ensure you. Uh, but most importantly, uh, my mentor, uh, who is Professor uh, Tan Chong Tin, he is the one who has enlightened uh, my professional path, guided and shown me the way and support me all these years, even until now. And uh, I would like to take this uh, special opportunity uh, to give him the great honor. Together with Prof Tan, we have many uh, fellows. Of course, the first one is uh, Dr. Serini, who came back from UK. We have Min An, who came all the way from Vietnam, joining us today. We have Dr. Kai from Myanmar, and of course, Si Lei, our MC. Jasin from Indonesia, and uh, Saidatu from uh, Kota Baru. What we hope is that our work will continue, uh, not only by one person, but by a group of different people, and can be carried on uh, continuously. And of course, I would like to acknowledge our research team, postgraduate students, and medical students who have been with us, especially uh, Jason and Tim, who has got uh, TC with distinction this year, which I would like to congratulate them for their work. And of course, uh, our fellows, which I've informed, uh, informed Prof. April just now, that they are from Myanmar, Indonesia, Vietnam, Laos, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Mozambique. And we hope that this network will continue to serve people with epilepsy, not only in Malaysia, not in, only in, in UM, but in many uh, other countries as well. Now I would like to show and highlight our collaborative team in research. Of course, it starts from with the, within the neurology lab, among the neurologists, but of course, we have Wairavan, our neurosurgeon. We have Prof. Nolisa and Katini from radiology. We have Prof. Ong and Chong Yi from pediatrics. We have Prof. Ong, Kam Tong, and Man from pathology. Claire and Rafsa from SPM. Chong Guan from psychiatry. And of course, my best friend, uh, Seng, Bring, Seng Beng uh, from palliative. This is among faculty of medicine, of course, they are networked with the university, other, other faculty in the University of Malaya, including uh, Prof. Ng Ching Ching from Biological Science, Prof. Lo from the Psychology Dean Office, 
Prof. Zarin from Pharmacology, Prof. Fatima and No Azwan from Biomedical Engineering, Prof. De Maisato Nozihan from Computer Science and Informative, uh, Info Information Technology, Ella Corrin from Linguistic and uh, Lo Yoklin from Pharmacy. And with that, we have developed further with our friends at our neurology colleagues in Malaysia, especially Prof. Raymond and uh, Professor uh, Tan Hu Jen, who is sitting here today. Thank you very much. We also have, especially Irene Lui, who has given me a lot of support. She is my senior in UM as well, and currently in uh, Sabrang Jaya. There are also other neurologists, fellows, and friends, including the non-neurologists, include which are uh, Hu Yin from Taylor, uh, Lisa from UCSI, Vicky from HMC, and Prof. Loa. Uh, from UNISA and, of, and uh, our friends from East Malaysia, especially uh, Dr. Lo Wan Chong from Kuching. In the region, our work continue with those in the Southeast Asia, in Asian, uh, in Asia, in Australia and New Zealand, as well as in other parts of the world. Just as I mentioned, all this work is not by one person, it's by a big team who has worked together to achieve what uh, I have achieved today. And this is the number of publications. I would like to acknowledge my friends, my fellow friends from different parts of the world and uh, as well as in those, for those in UM and our ex-friends who has come all the way, uh, especially my cosmic in 1994-99 uh, UM uh, batch, who has come uh, all the way to support uh, the lecture today and to support me. Thank you uh, so much. And last but not least, uh, my family who is sitting here. My son is now in Kedah. He cannot join us. Uh, but I have my brother uh, sitting as well as the the main person uh, in, in my life, who is my wife, uh, <laughs> Le Hua, sitting in front. And my mother, who uh, cannot come today. Of course, I'll give all the glory to God, who has been showing me the mercy, the blessing, the way uh, in all these years. Uh, the slide has moved a little bit, but I would like to show you the photo first. Using the title, We Stand on the Shoulders of Giants, which was mentioned in the TJ Danaraj uh, uh, lecture many years ago. And the picture on the right up, upper corner is University Malaya Faculty of Medicine in 1960s. And you can find these photos along the corridor outside the library. And there is so much change now in 2020. Similarly, this is not only for the buildings in UM, but also in epilepsy service and in many other medical services in UM as well. We believe that whatever we are doing today, uh, standing uh, is because we stand on the shoulders of giants. And what we hope is that from us, we can train more newer generations to carry on the work and uh, make uh, Malaysia a better country to stay. With that, I would uh, like to say uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof Lin, for your very inspiring lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite Prof April back to the podium to conclude today's inaugural lecture. The word professor, or the, the, the 
role of a professor comes from the word profess. And Professor Lim Keng Xiang has certainly professed his passion for the treatment of his patients um, with epilepsy. You have taken us from mad goats to current day precision therapeutics for patients with epilepsy. In that journey, you have shown us how it is not enough for a single individual to want to do something or to achieve something. It cannot be done without the work of many, many individuals to achieve something significant. Whether it be from modern diagnostics, modern therapeutics, or the more holistic aspects of managing these patients, you have shown us how you and others like you have worked together to improve the lives of patients with epilepsy. I am particularly uh, impressed that you have such a good working relationship with our neurosurgical team. Um, and this just goes to show that if we venture beyond our usual circles, beyond our own echo chambers, we can find the answer. And it is actually a very um, nice um, closure of the circle because way before when pharmacologics were available for the treatment of epilepsy, what did people do? They did trephination, which is surgery, right? So, so the point is that you have illustrated uh, very eloquently and very passionately that if we work together, we can move mountains. And I think that's really a message that I hope all of those present today will take away with them. But I think beyond the therapeutics, uh, beyond the technical aspects, I think what I am particularly impressed with is that you have seen beyond the disease in your patients. Uh, you have seen them as people. You have seen the humanity in your patients. Um, and by doing so, you have understood that in order to improve the lives of those you care for, it is not just about treating the disease. It's treating the whole patient. It's, it's, it's managing um, the entire um, social and uh, community-related aspects around the patient. And recognizing that all of us are here really on borrowed time, you have taken the extra step forward to ensure that the next generation that comes will carry on your good work and continue to improve the lives of those around them. So I'm not going to take very much longer, but I felt that I needed to read this quote from another very famous epileptic. And this is Theodore Roosevelt, who, of course, you know, has, was, was a U.S. president. And he said, Far better is it to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy nor suffer much because they live in a gray twilight that knows not victory nor defeat. So I think, Professor Lim, with the journey that you have shared with us, we can all agree that you certainly are not living in that gray twilight. Um, and I wish you every success in your future endeavors. And I hope that your journey will continue to inspire those of us who are here in University Malaya, as well as your extended network. Congratulations again, and we're very proud of you. Please take a seat, Prof. Right. Thank you, Professor April, for chairing the lecture today. And thank you again to Prof Lim for your very inspiring lecture. So, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to commemorate today by taking some photographs. But because uh, the crowd is kind of big today, so um, I would like to invite uh, um, uh, the guests and the audience today to come on stage for photograph uh, by batch. So, first, I would like to invite Prof Lim's family members to come on stage for a photograph.
Yeah. Uh, should we? Uh, should we ask Prof. April to uh, stay back for just for a little while for the photo session? Uh, can I just invite uh, our fellow neurologists, neurosurgeons, neuropathologists uh, to come on stage for photograph? Prof. Tan, uh, Prof. Go, Prof. Warawan, Prof. Wong, uh, Sherni, Prof. Tan Hujan, Dr. Ui. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I prof, prof Nina, prof, prof Lim, uh, Japing. and uh, Sally. You. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking for <laughs> so I don't miss out somebody. Can I um okay. can I invite our neuro neural lab staff to come down, let you me and your staff. You just take a quick photo. Come, come. And uh, I also like to invite those from Faculty of Medicine as well. Prof. Uh, Lim Sukun. Uh, and Prof Lim's uh, students. 
team uh, may... Sorry, last one, Prof. Stephanie, Neha. Thank you, Prof. April. So thank you, everyone. This concludes our event today. Uh, thank you for sharing this very memorable uh, moment with Prof. Lim. I would like to invite all the audience to synapse for some refreshment. So for those who are not familiar with our faculty, synapse is just one floor up here. You can take the staircase just outside the hall for some refreshment. So thank you, everyone, again. Stay safe and take care. Thank you.